but uh, actually I, I organized the splinter meeting at what, what was then uh, the EGU meetings in, in Strasbourg and I had a meeting on I had called it uh, chemical evolution in hydrothermal systems I thought and I sent that in but the organizers changed the text which I didn't notice so never change the text of anybody so in this program it said chemical evolution of hydrothermal systems and that's something completely different <laughs> So that was a problem. But you were there, I remember. I think that's why I came. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good change then. But then actually, uh, under the uh, clear or dark s starlit uh, uh, skies of, of the high desert in Oregon, that was a year later, we were working on, on, on this book, Marine Hydrothermal Systems and the Origin of Life that was sponsored of, of the Scientific Committee on Oceanic Research, nothing else. And uh, we had started the year before, but you weren't on the first meeting in Sweden. But I think that the memory there was the uh, jacuzzi in the dark night of <laughs> <laughs> in June in Oregon. And we could recognize some of the stars. Isn't that right? That's right. Yeah. It's and embarrassing enough. Uh -huh. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mike is a geologist uh, now at the APL in Pasadena, but before that, University of Glasgow Department of Geology and Applied Geology. I never understood that. And then you were a field geologist in Ireland, wasn't that so? So, but now today is going to be on the origin of life and why life. And, and afterwards, we can meet upstairs and continue the discussion. And tomorrow as well, because he's going to perform at Nodita in the afternoon. So there's plenty of time. Please, Mike. Thank you. Uh, I say nobody looks as though they're going to take notes, which is a great thing. <laughs> and you don't have to, because if you want this presentation, uh, Anna has, has it. So please, anybody who wants the presentation, it's quite free. So why does life start? Well, it starts as a mechanism for expanding free energy on a rocky planet with its pent-up electrons with respect to an oxidized exterior. So it's a very simple point to make that it's a mechanism for expending free energy, rather like uh, convection is a mechanism for expending thermal free energy. And indeed, I'm going to suggest that the two are coupled together. Uh, if you think about it, life could not exist without convection. So what does it do? It hydrogenates carbon dioxide. That's it. It hydrogenates carbon dioxide. Where will it be? It'll be on any sunny, wet, rocky planet massive enough to hold on to a carbon dioxide atmosphere. So let's look at our planet, but with respect to kind of astrobiological space and time. We're going back 4.3 billion years. It's not the same planet. Not at all. We, we have to divest of ourselves of this idea that it's a similar planet. It's a tempestuous water world. There are no land, there's no land, no continental land masses. The day lasts four or five hours. It's continually bombarded with uh, meteorites. It, lightning is carrying on everywhere. The storms are unabatable. Uh, and the moon is probably just beyond the Roche limit. So this is a very wild, tempestuous world. And uh, there's very minor amounts of methane and ammonia. They're vestigial in the atmosphere. There's no warm metal pond for Darwin's uh, origin of life. So let's, <laughs> as geologists and uh, physicists, we're always interested in initial conditions. And I think that that's oftentimes missing from origin of life studies. What were the initial conditions like? So we've got, to get the, we've got to get the physics right to start with. And we've got to realize that it was a stormy place and this is just to remind us of convection and how pervasive convection is on the planet. From the core, which of course protects us now with uh, Van Allen belts uh, uh, from uh, the cosmic radiation or too much cosmic radiation, into the mantle to give us plate tectonics, into the crust to give us hydrothermal convection, into the ocean, which gives us uh, convection within the ocean. And then... Uh, of course, within the atmosphere. 
So as a water world, one of the points is H2O, what happens? The world produces some hydrogen from this water. So it, we're emanating hydrogen. But the, at the same time, at high temperature, we're emanating carbon dioxide. So we have a carbon dioxide atmosphere. We always had a carbon dioxide atmosphere. Geologists ever since Darwin have emphasized that it's always been a carbon dioxide atmosphere. And of course, it's changed now, but still the carbon dioxide is all important because out of the window we can see life hydrogenates carbon dioxide, even with the help of photosynthesis now. So we've got an oxidized atmosphere, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitric oxide, and phosphate which, of course, immediately uh, gets rained out into the ocean. But this, and there were probably 10 to 100 times as many volcanoes 4.3 billion years ago. So it's, a, it's an oxidized exterior. You know, we, th we think of oxygen now as, a, as, as causing uh, the oxidation. CO2, H2O, and the rest of this, it's an oxidized exterior. So the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, which means the ocean was going to be carbonated. It's carbonated water, effectively. It's perhaps a pH of around about 5.5 to 6, maybe lower at times. If there's much, much CO, uh, uh, sulfur dioxide, it could go even lower than this. There are lakes in Cameroon, in, in West Africa, that which, have, which have a pH of about 5.2, under 10 atmospheres of carbon dioxide. So, it's got a re reduced electron-rich an alkaline interior, and that's a big important point. And because of the reduced nature of the iron, the ferrous iron, and even a little bit of native iron, then the water gets reduced as the iron gets oxidized to generate this hydrogen. So this system, actually, in a kind of large, if I can bear to use the word fractal sense, is like a large autotroph. That is an autotrophic bacterium. An, aut an autotroph is one that uses just basic substances like carbon dioxide, phosphate, sulfur, and, uh, and so on. Actually, we could even be more specific and say the Earth is actually, or the early Earth was like a methanogen. That is, it generated methane. Or we can think of it as an electrochemical cell. The electrochemical cell would have had an output of around about 1 volt, or perhaps, uh, seven, perhaps 700 millivolts, right thereabouts. Uh, so, you can think of it in both those ways. So there, of course, is a methanogen. Can we think of life just bubbling off from the surface of the planet? And I think that that's one way of, think of thinking about it. So the Earth is like a methanogen. It, it makes methane fairly easily. We know it's a problem for us to conceive of uh, life on other planets because it's so easy to make methane. So when they discovered methane on Mars, uh, in 2004, and there's been many papers since, everybody's puzzled. Does this mean there's life on Mars, or is it merely uh, emanating from a hydrothermal interaction? One point to make is that it's almost certainly not volcanic, because there's a peculiar crossover, and I, if anybody wants to talk about this afterwards, I'd be keen to do it, but there's a crossover be between the, the uh, oxidation states of carbon and the oxidation states of iron, so that at high temperatures, so we say above 500 degrees centigrade, Carbon dioxide is a stable state down there in the mantle. And at lower temperature, below 400 degrees centigrade, it's methane. So we could think of uh, the world, of course, is making methane. It just makes it rather slowly. And what happens is that uh, life quickens these reactions. And we can, how does it do it? And I think we can think of life bubbling off. And this is, uh, and I'm going to come back to this kind of diagram soon. But what we can say is that if we bubble off life from the surface of the planet, and we're below the ocean surface, of course, we've got a solution which is going to be somewhat alkaline, or quite alkaline. It's going to have hydrogen in it from that water. It's going to come in and kind of blow up a bubble, but maybe this bubble is merely inorganic, not organic. Uh, but on the outside, there'll be protons uh, and oxidized substances like carbon dioxide. And it's th this bubble that I think we're, in this kind of bubble, where the two... Uh, interaction between carbon dioxide and hydrogen and those protons can generate faster and faster uh, organic chemical reactions which eventually evolve into life. And 
the, the sim similarity between, so we say, an autotrophic bacterium and this kind of first bubble is similar in the sense that inside most bacteria and archaebacteria, archae the pH is normally normal to somewhat alkaline, and on the outside, although the, the life does it for itself, you have a, a high amount of protons on the outside. Now, one of the things about taking the initial conditions seriously is that life could not, as it started to evolve, couldn't invent anything for itself. It all had to be there on a plate. Everything it required had to be in the one place, in a nice low entropy state. Uh, all the energy, all the materials, all had to be in one place, and for quite a long time. So we've got a hydrothermal fluid here. It's alkaline on the inside, acidic on the outside. That means there's a proton gradient of about five, five units, which is equal to about 300 millivolts, which is uh, enough energy, actually, to drive a bacterium. But if you add the other oxidants on the outside, like nitric oxide, you've even got more energy than that. But notice it's commensurate energy. It's not energy like lightning, 5,000 volts or a million volts. It's, the, it's just the amount of energy that life actually uses. So, hydrogen plus carbon dioxide reacts slowly to produce methane. So here it is. Here's the standard reaction, and the planet can do it all by itself because it makes water at the same time. So that's how the planet can work. It does work. <coughs> and it has the potential to produce acetic acid or acetic, uh, which has got a, a two-carbon uh, molecule here, uh, but it's not so reduced. It's kind of in between oxidized and reduced. And it seems to us that the planet can't make acetate. But in fact, there's a lot of living systems that uh, make acetate. Um, vinegar is another way of putting it. And what we're suggesting is these two reactions are kind of quickened uh, to life. They're speeded up. Uh, they're, they're enlivened, so to speak. Uh, because uh, many people would say that the way far from equilibrium uh, systems work is that they want to maximize entropy production probably as rapidly as they can. So this is what's happening here. So we've got convective systems and we've got the beginnings of metabolic systems. But where? Where, where are we going to discharge this energy? Well, when black smokers were first discovered at the mid-oceanic ridges, it seemed obvious that maybe they started there. And uh, Jack Corliss and others indeed, who were responsible for finding these black smokers and predicting them, uh, thought that life might have started at these black smokers. Now, you may know about, I'm sure you know about these, they're, they're buffered around about 400, or thermostated around about 400 degrees centigrade, probably because of the buoyancy of, of water at its critical point. Uh, and they're fairly well chemostated with uh, uh, same old metals coming out, iron, zinc, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and so forth. But actually, they're fairly oxidized, and, and they're always acidic, pH 2 to 3.5 or thereabouts. <clears throat> this is what they look like, and you can see why they thought immediately that uh, life might have started there, because life today seems so happy here. There's crabs, there's fish, there's these tube worms, and so forth. So it looks like, and although it's 400 degrees centigrade, which of course is much, uh, is, is extremely, well, it's, it's much hotter than your oven, uh, Nevertheless, it seemed like a good idea, and, and Jack Hall has published such an idea with uh, John Barris and uh, Hoffman in uh, 1979. Uh, they had problems because, yes, it is so hot, and, and uh, the, res the abiding paradigm was that of uh, Miller and Oparin and Haldane, and that is that there had to have been an organic suit to start with on the planet. Uh, and so they came in hot and strong against this, saying, this is ludicrous, life would, never could start here because it would be destroyed immediately by these very high temperatures. Uh, and so people felt a little kind of uh, worried about this. But we can say they're too oxidized, they're too acidic, they're too spasmodic, uh, too hot, yeah, much too hot. But they are useful, if we can put it in that anthropic way, uh, in generating the trace metals that uh, we know that we require and even still buy from chemist shops to this day. Now, one of the points about the black smoker is that black smoke is made of mostly iron, nickel sulfides and manganese oxides and some silica and so forth. On the early earth, there wouldn't have been black smokers at these 400 degrees centigrade springs, of which there were probably even more, by the way. But and the, the reason why that is is because 
the reason why they're black is the precipitation. And the precipitation, you might think, is due to cooling. Actually, the precipitation, the immediate precipitation, is due to the mixing with the alkaline solution of the ocean. So, and they found that when they first took the samples from deep within these black smokers, they took them up onto the surface, and nothing happened when they cooled them down until they added seawater. And then you got the precipitation. So in other words, on the early Earth, those uh, metals and sulfur and so forth would have gone straight into the ocean and would have been uh, super saturated within the ocean. So they were kind of available. So we were kind of aware of the problems of, of uh, things being too hot at uh, black smokers, but we'd been working on, on various mineral deposits and we knew that there were various hydrothermal systems which were much lower temperature. Uh, so in fact we replied to uh, the Stanley Miller and Jeffrey Baylor paper in 1988, uh, uh, yes, 1988 that admonished people like Corliss for saying life started at black smokers. Um, we reply, replied to Miller and Bader saying, well, actually, there are other lower temperature uh, substance, m m other lower temperature springs. I have to say, I had no idea that this was the Stanley Miller. I mean, this is, I had no idea he'd been doing his PhD since 1951, but it was him. Uh, and uh, they weren't too happy about this either. But the, the point that we wanted to make is that you could have low temperature springs, which were thermostated, perhaps by the rheology or the strength of the rocks. Uh, and we knew that as these waters would go down, even if they're carbonic and acidic, as they go down to the crust, they would oxidize the crust uh, to some extent with the, with the water and the CO2. They hydrate it, they, they'd lay down carbonate. Uh, they'd, of course, become hotter, but they would become alkaline. Uh, and at that time we thought perhaps pH 9 or so, they'd perhaps return at 150 degrees centigrade, they'd have things like uh, ammonia, perhaps a little bit of acetic acid, uh, some s organic sulfides, uh, but mainly hydrogen. So hydrogen, of course, is that great fuel, and it's the hydrogen that is the uh, carrier gas uh, for uh, the fuel uh, for uh, electrons, of course, from, from the planet. And it brings it up towards the surface in a kind of titration, uh, and it would titrate back into the ocean, except that you tend to get precipitation of uh, a fouling of, because of inorganic precipitants. And, this, and I think it's this very frustration that allows for careful interaction between the hydrogen coming up here and the carbon dioxide on the planet, and they are very far from equilibrium from each other. But there's something else to add to this, and that is you've got protons to help dr as, as another source of energy. And I think that that's very significant in this. And we had the idea that these, these would cause uh, bubbles, uh, inorganic bubbles, and within this perhaps one would get the interaction of the carbon dioxide from outside, the hydrogen from inside, and generate what's the microbiologists would know of as the reverse Krebs cycle or the reverse T uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle. I mean, I think that this was wrong. But nevertheless, we thought that this was the kind of organic, the hatchery of life. It was inorganic hatchery making organic molecules that eventually would quicken uh, these reactions to life itself. So, about 10 years later, th uh, such a system was found about 15 kilometers from the uh, mid-oceanic ridge, or 15 kilometers from the kind of black smoker that we've just seen. Uh, and we would, and this, this turned out to be alkaline, and we would say that this is where the energy uh, that was uh, in the planet related to this kind of geochemical, electrochemical cell I've been talking about, this is the best place to discharge such energy. Uh, at this place, what's called an, an off-axis off spring. And in, in the year 2000, uh, such a spring was discovered. Uh, it's called Lost City. Uh, many of you all know about this. Uh, this passes nearly all the requirements, except for one significant one. Uh, well, one, it's in stable state for at least 30,000 years, and probably a lot longer than that. Uh, which is a huge amount of time, because when we should think about the, inorgan the organic interactions of life, we shouldn't think in terms of years, we should thought, think in terms of nano and microseconds, the actual reaction times of, of molecules, not our lifetimes. So you would think, and I'm guessing here, you know, something like 10 to, the 20, 10 to the power of 20 nanoseconds would be, I think, enough time for life to have started. So in other words, I think well within a thousand years, but 
uh, so in other words it was fast it's, I'm a geologist, everybody thinks that's great because you've got all those millions and hundreds of millions of years so you can evolve to life, if you don't make life fast it will just drop back on itself so to speak and, and as a geologist I know that much of the geological uh, diary or legend is empty pages and then something amazing happens and then it's empty pages, empty pages, empty pages so that's because things happen fast, oftentimes. Not all the time, but oftentimes fast. So I think that's the mindset, to think of life emerging rapidly. And what does this spring have? Uh, it's got calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide. That's making these huge spires up to 60 meters high. The pH is up to 12. So it's well buffered, a pretty alkaline uh, pH 11 to 12. And it's thermostat at around about, probably we think about 100 degrees centigrade. And Temperatures have never been recorded above 94 degrees centigrade in these kind of springs. And it's got 15 millimoles of hydrogen, which is an extraordinary amount of hydrogen, but also uh, probably inorganic uh, methane up to 2 millimoles. And that's, that returns to this point that the Earth can make methane all by itself. It doesn't have to have an archibacterium or a methanogen to do that. Uh, what's missing? Sulfur's missing. So that's, that was critical because we thought sulfur was all important for this. But you will notice that if you, t if you cut through these structures, then you've got some compartments. And I think compartmentalization at the emergence of life is all important. We can't just let uh, these new chemicals, these new organic molecules, whatever they are, just dissipate into the ocean. They've got to be trapped within uh, compartments. And not only that, uh, you've got to have the gradients acting between, through the compartment walls, the various chemical and even thermal gradients. So this is what one looks like, a uh, nice spire here. If you look carefully, look at the tiny wee spires on the sides as well. So you have very fine uh, little chimneys as well as big chimneys. So... If you're not a geologist, the one thing I would, and, but you're interested in the emergence of life, the one thing we need to know about is serpentinization. That's the only real thing that matters so much. So this is, serpentinized is a very common rock. Actually, it's not that common in Sweden, but in many parts of the world it's very common. And you'll have shop windows of uh, serpentinized, and here you have the United Nations building, and right behind Obama is serpentinized. And what is it? It's, uh, it's a reaction, it's a, it's a mineral uh, reaction between olivine, which is in many, which is in all uh, ocean floor basalts and uh, and other rocks that make up the ocean floor, and that reacts with water to make magnetite, which is uh, like lodestone, which is more oxidized iron, uh, serpentinite, alkali, and hydrogen. And if, in chemical terms. Uh, and very crudely, here's the, the olivine mineral, magnesium ion silicate. The iron is in uh, Fe2 plus state, interacts with water, the iron gets oxidized, silicate gets released, magnesium and calcium gets released to some extent to, to make the alkaline condition, and hydrogen gets released because of the oxidation uh, of the iron and the reduction of water. And if you have carbon dioxide in the system, geochemically, we know that we can go from carbon dioxide to formate, to formaldehyde, to methanol, to methane. And we know that we know the planet can do that. Uh, and that these are single carbon redox reactions. So what you're doing is hydrogenating carbon dioxide, okay, or reducing carbon dioxide, or adding electrons to carbon dioxide. So, but if you look at it from a thermodynamic point of view, with delta G's uh, positive, uh, showing you that uh, the initial stages of carbon dioxide reduction are uh, frustrated. They're, they're, they're thermodynamically uphill and they're kinetically difficult. So to go from carbon dioxide to formate is pretty difficult, and go from formate to formaldehyde right up there is very difficult. It, it, it requires energy, and, uh, and there's problems of the kinetics as well. But once you're up to formate, then it's geochemically, uh, thermodynamically downhill to methane. So if you can make a little bit of, of formate, as you know about thermodynamics, you can always make a little bit of stuff. There's always going to be a tiny wee part of a reaction that goes. Make a little bit of formate, you make even less formaldehyde. But once you've made formaldehyde, that formaldehyde will tend to go down to methanol. So you drag the CO2 up uh, towards getting reduced in a kind of geochemical siphon. So that's what happens. And 
This graph shows us, which is taken basically from a lovely paper by Maiden uh, in 2000, shows us why there's life at all. If this, were a, if this were CO2 down here or methane, there would be no requirement for life in the universe. None. It's because it's uphill that we need the, the kind of catalysis of life to do the job, to, to make methane and all the other organic molecules. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, it would all be a geochemical. So, we can look at the methanogenic pathway, and uh, methanogenesis, can, because of catalysis, uh, makes it an easier pathway. Uh, but you'll notice in this case you have to go from carbon dioxide to formate, and you need an ionic gradient for that, either sodium or protons, and that'll push up, uh, for example, it'll push up the formate, and then once you're at formate, it's relatively downhill. Of course, it uses very complicated enzymes, the, the problem with the pathway, the, the, the real problem with this pathway, because it looks so facile, is that life has to get energy out of these reactions to be able to feed back on itself. Uh, and in fact, the, it can get energy from methanogenesis, but it's extraordinarily complicated. And I'm not going to go into that now, but it's a very, very complicated system, uh, or relatively complicated system, and it could not be initial. What we think must have been initial was that way towards acetate instead. So you go up through formate to formaldehyde, formaldehyde uh, methylene, uh, and down to uh, a methyl group, and that reacts with uh, carbon monoxide to make acetate. So this is the, I think this is the first ever pathway. And you notice I'm talking about pathways, not cycles. There couldn't be a cycle. These ideas of hypercycles and so forth can't be uh, possible on the early Earth. You've got to have things that are relatively linear and straightforward, I think. Uh, so you can ask yourself, and many people might know about the, the ideas of uh, Eigen and Schuster and so forth, that we need hypercycles. Why do they need hypercycles? Because it's so hard to make organic molecules from the organic soup that's supposed to rain in from space. Uh, and it's a high entropy system, so they, they need hypercycles to kind of make everything purified. We don't need to do that. We're building from the bottom up. You know, we've just got little stones. They're all very similar to each other. We just build it up simply from carbon dioxide through these molecules out to acetate. So this is our argument for the first ever uh, pathway. So let's go back to how we can consider this. We now know about serpentinization. The water comes down. It, it gravitates down cracks into the crust, and it serpentinizes the crust. And that's so it still oxidizes, hydrates, and carbonates the crust. It comes back up, and uh, now it's got hydrogen, some methane, and probably a little bit of formate, uh, but nothing much else. And we would argue that perhaps uh, the thermostatting is due to making the rock so ductile, so plastic, that the water can't get down to uh, any deeper and can't get any hotter. So it tends to stay around about uh, 100, 120, 130 degrees centigrade maximum, and always with a high pH and it returns to the surface, and now we're precipitating uh, inorganic materials, including iron sulfide, uh, which of course I have to come back to. Uh, we can get the iron and the nickel and the protons from the ocean, because that's come partly through from the black smokers and partly through from volcanoes, and we're just supplying the hydrogen and probably some sulfide in the hydrothermal solution. Now we have a kind of membranous froth or compartments being, and we would suggest between 40 degrees and 100 degrees centigrade, we've got some organic synthesis and indeed some fractionation. And this, this then, again, is the idea that this will be the hatchery, the actual hatchery of life. So we can go to the laboratory then, because we're missing something, we're missing sulfide. Uh, so we have this uh, experiment going at Jet Propulsion Laboratory whereby we put ocean water in one of these vessels, uh, hydrothermal solution in the other, and we can vary the mix as we go up through the feeders towards uh, the, uh, hy the hydrothermal system of the hot springs on the sea floor, these alkaline springs, and we can see what happens. And what we've done is we've packed this uh, central uh, reactor with serpentinite, uh, basalt wool, iron, iron and nickel sulfides and copper sulfides and so forth, and we see what comes out. Now, unfortunately, of course, as soon as you show anything like this, everything's that we're going to get a rabbit out of it. We're going to get, you know, this is, going to, this is the origin of life. This is not the origin of life. This is trying to get the initial conditions right. The initial conditions are different to now when you've got all this oxygen on the planet. So the water comes out, and we take it to another lab, and uh, 
we then in, inject it into what we think of as the Hadean, the uh, most ancient ocean, uh, which has got ferrous chloride in and so forth. And we find, yes, we can make these bubbles of iron, nickel sulfides with, sil with some silica uh, and so forth. And if we look at these, we find we can make methane, which we would expect to be able to do because that's what the world does. So we make methane uh, through sepentanization. And we also show that we can generate quite a lot of hydrogen sulfide, up to 14 millimoles of hydrogen sulfide before, I think, pacification sets in. And we're still left with one or two millimoles of, of uh, sulfide. So that explains why we can get the precipitation of the iron nickel sulfides and perhaps with a bit of molybdenum uh, and uh, cobalt and so forth and even zinc. So what do the compartments look like? So if we, if we section the uh, that hatchery and we look at the compartments, and I, can you see that well enough or do you want me to drop down, down the... It's okay? Okay, so you can see it's quite a big compartment up there, it's a hundred micron scale, but within that compartment you can find even tinier compartments with quite thin uh, membranous looking material, which is about one or two uh, nanometers across, and these are the, uh, the this is the in inside of it. So you can see a lot of a, a lot of surface here. So a lot of catalytic possibilities in such a structure. So we'd say this is the kind of uh, required compartment uh, that life would need to to get started as a kind of vehicle. So we have to have a vehicle. I mean, if we think about it in terms of a car, you've got to have a vehicle, and the vehicle's got to have an engine. And then if we get this far, we can put a computer in it. You'll notice I'm not talking about the RNA world. The RNA world is a computer. You know, you've got to have a vehicle and an engine before you can get to the RNA world, to my point of view. And I don't, I won't have time to talk about the RNA world, but I'm very happy to talk about it afterwards. Uh, so this is uh, the basic system. So we can go back on this and think about uh, the actual reactor. So we can think of this in all kinds of ways. So here's our precipitates on the ocean floor. We can think of it as an electric chemical reactor, a chemical reactor, an affinity column, a hatchery, many different ways to think about this. But effectively, this is, this is where we would say that all, all the ingredients and all the energies required for life are right here, uh, including even molybdenum and tungsten. Life cannot do without molybdenum and tungsten. It's, I mean, this is element number 74, but still it's absolutely required, especially at high temperature, by life. And we think that that can come through in, as a sulfide uh, in alkaline conditions. Uh, some cyanide probably, some hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, uh, hydrogen. Uh, so that's the, that's the feed, the fuel, the, the electron-rich materials going into these electron-poor materials like carbon dioxide, uh, nitric oxide, nitrate, sulfur and so on. And here we just blow up one of these, some of these compartments and show that the hydrogen and CO2 can interact here to make a small but ever continuous number of organic molecules and retain some of the organic precursors, especially the charged organic precursors, things like carboxylic acids. And notice that you've got proton modus force here, right here. We can put the proton, the protons can come through the walls uh, and they can act as uh, additional energizers for the system. So what can we do in terms of uh, appealing to the literature for experiments? Well, there's a very nice experiment by Gunter Bechtesheiser and Claudia Huber, uh, and they managed to make uh, thioacetate, which is, I mean, they, man they managed to make acetate, really, effectively, but notice they didn't use carbon dioxide, so we haven't got there yet, and they, ha they start off with methyl sulfide, which is kind of pretty well reduced anyway, but they did at least put them together uh, to make this so-called activated acetate, and they made a big thing about the nickel iron sulfide being the catalyst. Now that may or may not be. We've never been able to reproduce this experiment, but what is really sticking out to me, rather than this, this appears to be a sore thumb, but the real sore thumb is that most of these reactions are very happy in highly alkaline conditions. And you'll notice that nickel sulfide is pretty good, so it can't be anything to do with pyrite. Uh, and nickel sulfate is also significant. So it looks like nickel is the key uh, element there for catalysis. Uh, but anyway, here's, we're getting somewhere. We're making acetate from... Uh, we've made two big jumps, but they've made acetate. Just to emphasize this, because people get so strung up on the pyrite hypothesis, and that is that pi this is pyrite, and right in the middle, is, that green is an iron. 
and it's, it's protected by 12 sulfurs, and then you get another ion, and so forth. And if you look at it, this looks nothing like a biological molecule. Nothing. Uh, basically, it's something you can buy in these gem shops and put it on the mantelpiece, and they look very pretty. It's called fool's gold, as you know, and I think that it has full origin of life people as well. I think the real mineral that counts is something called mckinnawite, or mckinnawite. So when we precipitate our iron uh, sulfides and silica in the lab, this is what the kind of chip, we might make a chimney like this. There are all kinds of types of chimneys, but make a chimney like this. And they might well have little compartments on the side of them. Uh, these are the kind of compartments we appeal to as being uh, those hatcheries. But this is what mckinnawite looks like in molecular terms. Uh, it's iron, in this case, iron, red, sulfur, yellow, and so forth. And you can, we've just taken out one rom of this. Iron, nickel, sulfide. Uh, sorry, iron, sulfide. It could be iron, nickel, sulfide, or iron, iron, sulfide. But it's basically Fe2S2 or FeNiS2. So that's an incredibly intriguing point because, one, those ions are close enough together to allow electrons to run, jump from one to another. It's 2.2 angstrom units, I think. Uh, but more significant than that, didn't expect to see that. Hold on. Uh, more significant than that, here's the uh, comparison between something called hydrogenase. And hydrogenase is something that, it's, it's a, an enzyme that can take hydrogen and split it into two electrons and two protons. So it, and then you can start to do some real work if you've got two electrons and two protons. And you'll notice that the active center of uh, hydrogenase, again, uh, is iron, iron, sulfur, sorry, iron to sulfur, iron to sulfur. So it's the same shape. I mean, it's, it's not entire, it's uh, the same topology. Not exactly the same shape, same topology. So could it be that mckinnawite is, is actually just there on a plate for making the first hydrogenase? Indeed, could it have been the first hydrogenase? A very uh, simple one and a very inefficient one, but just efficient enough to make a few protons and a few electrons from the hydrogen. And intriguingly, you go out from this structure to another structure, which is two of these put together. So you've got iron, sulfur, iron, sulfur, and then another one, and they put them together and you make a cube. And if you look at, if you sulfidize that, or oxidize mckinnawite a little bit, you get this mineral called gregite. And this is a semiconducting ferromagnetic mineral. And we think, and nickel will often be in that site that I pointed to here. And that makes a great site for catalysis. And we think probably the nickel iron sulfides that Bechtesheiser was using probably looked actually like this. They were nothing to do with pyrite. They were this mineral gregite. Now, gregite is a rare mineral because it's incredibly unstable. It's even more <coughs> unstable than McKinnaway. But of course, instability is important for catalysis. It's important for life to be able to <coughs> jump from one situation, one uh, kind of electronic state to another. So if we look at this carefully, then what have we got so far? We've got something that hydrogenates, with uh, hydrogenase, that is something that can take protons and electrons, uh, take, them, take them from hydrogen, split up hydrogen effectively. And then we want to be able to make acetate. So here's, here's one of the uh, typical early enzymes. It's called acetate synthase. So this is the one that helps to make acetate. Now in fact you we actually needed to make carbon monoxide as well, from carbon dioxide. And it looks, I haven't bothered to put them on here, but it looks incredibly similar to this. Same kind of structure. It's called carbon monoxide dehydrogenase. It's in the same uh, enzyme as acetylcoenzyme synthase. There are a complex of uh, these two structures. But notice that you've got a cubane structure, this cube of these two rungs put together, just like gregite. So in other words, you can imagine that gregite could behave not very efficiently, without any organic help, but could perhaps, perhaps to reduce carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide and also to make uh, the acetate itself. Indeed, the acetate is generated actually on that nickel, the first green nickel, NIP there. The carbon monoxide and methyl group are put together there as nickel is oxidized and reduced, oxidized and reduced in that side. One of the things about gregite and these kind of structures is it's very forgiving. You can take an electron away or you can add an electron and it makes just a little bit of difference to the, uh, 
to the shape, it kind of breathes, but it doesn't change its topography, it doesn't change its entire coordination. So where are we? So so far we've got we've got the kind of metal enzymes that are significant, and I'm very keen always to remember David Garner's beautiful statement, uh, which goes, it's the inorganic elements that bring organic chemistry to life. It's the inorganic elements that bring organic chemistry to life. And you can think about that philosophically, the origin of life, or just the continuation of life, but they're all important to us. And when were they? When did they start? Well, you can go back to genetics, in genetics, and see that the very earliest enzymes in what's called the last universal common ancestor, the LUCA is the last universal common ancestor, before that and during that time, you had to have nitric oxide reductase, well, I haven't talked about that. You've got the nickel iron hydrogenase, which I have talked about. You've got acetyl coenzyme synthase, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase, and molybdenum enzymes that I have talked about. They're all there. Those metal enzymes are a feature of the earliest living systems, whereas uh, later systems are much more organic. They can do away without quite a lot of these metals. <coughs> so, we're going to go back to Vegetizer and notice that Vegetizer can relatively easily add ammonia, uh, interact ammonia with carboxylic acids. And when he does that, he makes alanine, tyrosine, uh, phenylalanine, uh, glutamate in incredible yields. Uh, all at these very nice temperatures between 50 and 75 degrees centigrade sometimes up to 100 degrees centigrade but always in alkaline conditions always around about the pKa of uh, the ammonium group so we've always got <coughs> this alkaline condition and so we get back to the significance of alkaline conditions uh, you'll notice that he, can, he uses iron sulfide but he's found that he can use ferrous hydroxide as well so again you don't have to have something that is going to make pyrite well, if we get that far, so we've got some amino acids, then we find that if we've got some pyrophosphate, you know, so think kind of matches, if you like, pyrophosphate is a very energetic mo molecule. If you've got pyrophosphate, or trimetaphosphate, so in other words, you've got three phosphates all together, and you react it with two glycine al the, the amino acids, you can make diglycine, or a short peptide, in a very short amount of time with extraordinary yields at pH 9. So we're on our way to making those, that first requirements, that first sense that you're actually getting somewhere with life, and that is you're making a peptide, a very short peptide. It's not a protein because it's not being coded, but it is acting a bit like a protein. Uh, so I should go back on that one. Uh, you can then join them up and make glycine 4, but this time you're at lower pH. So we would have to use the protons from that proton motive force to get to this situation. And in fact, you can go on to make six glycines. So that the yields are rather poor, but it does happen. And of course, one of the things about life is that it can begin to select one way or another, uh, which I could go back on. If you can make a peptide, then you're on the way to being able to interact an organic molecule with inorganic molecules that we realize are good catalysts. So here's, here's the interaction, the way we would imagine it, between the backbone of, an, of a peptide, that is the ammonium group, going through a hydrogen, as a, as a kind of a hydrogen bond to the sulfur in this case, and giving something that looks like, if there's microbiologists in the audience, uh, a ferridoxin, that is an iron sulfur protein, which many people think has got the longest, oldest pedigree of all. The oldest of all proteins is probably a ferridoxin, an iron for uh, uh, S4 structure. So we've got a kind of nest here for our egg. What's the advantage of the nest? Well, there's a lot of advantages for it. Well, one, it, it looks like a, a modern ferredoxin because ferredoxins themselves, the iron sulfides are always in a nest. <coughs> so that's, that's okay. It stops it crystallizing, which would be bad news for catalysis. In fact, it allows uh, the maximum surface to volume uh, ratio possible, uh, and it also prevents it now from dissolving. So, so it's kind of looking after, this, this nest is looking after this egg, if you like. But even more extraordinary is that, of course, this will certainly interact with any phosphate. So if you had a little bit of phosphate, and, and let's just remind ourselves of the importance of phosphate. So, so we now have something called adenosine triphosphate. I mean, that's what but in fact, the, the, the part that works with adenosine triphosphate is the triphosphate. 
the the adenine can be thought of as a kind of uh, as, as a, uh, you can stick stick the adenine onto, shall we say, a membrane, or, or it can be a kind of handle, so to speak. It's the, it's the phosphate that counts, and all. And, and you make your body weight every day of adenosine triphosphate. You keep on making it, it keeps on breaking down because you're using the energy, and you keep on making it up with the proton loaded force. Uh, so here, what we're suggesting is the very first uh, polymerase, uh, basically, or phosphatase, was actually uh, just a natural nest because it would be impossible to deny the interaction I mean, deny to them the interaction of the highly uh, anionic phosphate with the backbone, which is uh, with the hydrogen there, which is uh, uh, anionic, and the two just, if you like, self organize. They find each other and they one nests around another and looks extraordinarily like uh, a pyrophosphatase. And, and the interesting thing about this is to this day, in every bacteria, in every archaea, it's always like that, to this day. It's called the P-loop, the phosphate loop. Now, interesting thing about this, which I should have said before, and that is, if you, if you try and put two left-handed tyrosines together to make a peptide, they will immediately racemize. One will be left and one will be right. So, in, in other words, you know, the idea that somehow or other there's a hand in this in space, I think, is, to my mind, has got to be wrong. And in fact, you don't want handedness. You don't want it to be left-handed and right-handed. You know, it would be like dancing with your partner, always having to use the one hand or the, the, the partner who's hand, always having to use the other hand. If, you're, if you've got an, a heterochiral system, so you've got left-handed amino acids and right-handed amino acids, that allows a, a lot of flexibility and it allows a kind of nesting. Otherwise, the biochemists and the microbiologists will know you'll go off and make an alpha sheet or a beta helix, which wouldn't have uh, the function that something like this has. Uh, we, Nelson and I were talking about siderophores uh, earlier on. And, and the same thing, life needs to find iron in the ocean. It <coughs> uses heterochiral molecules, uh, uh, peptides, to do that, because it wants the flexibility. So it's a very flexible system. And even today, how, do, how does life keep this flexibility when it's ordered, when it's coded, and it's got to be uh, left-handed uh, uh, lepto amino acids and, uh, and uh, right-handed uh, DNA and RNA? How does it do it? It always retains two glycines, because that's a cow. Sometimes three, and sometimes even four glycines in here. So that's how life manages to deal with it. It doesn't. It has a non-chiral molecule in here to keep that kind of structure. So here's the P-loop. Here's the phosphate. In this case, it's a, a guanine, uh, guanine uh, tetraphosphate, a uh, three, three phosphate, three, three phosphates here. And here's the P-loop: glycine, glycine, valine, glycine, uh, lysine, serine. Uh, <coughs> just nesting uh, this the phosphates here. So again, you, it stops it from precipitating as a fully fledged phosphate. It stops it dissolving. Uh, indeed, we would say that. We could put it, we could have the first really functional system going now because if we've got a fairly, uh, a relatively long peptide now, should we say, uh, eight mer, I believe, this eight, eight uh, amino acids long, then this can behave, behave as what's called a pyrophosphatase, an idea that first started with Margareta and uh, Henrik uh, Balczewski, who some of you may know, uh, and they suggested that. The very first uh, uh, pyrophosphatase was not was not one of these extraordinary motors, you know, the tiniest motors known, ATP ages, but it, it was actually uh, a fairly static system which was uh, ligated in this kind of way. So there's the backbone, the nitrogens, the hydrogens, the oxygens. Uh, two phosphates can get together in that case. Uh, so and so we've got two phosphates in that upper diagram. To be together, they always need magnesium. Nearly always need magnesium. Why? Because they're, because they're so highly charged as, as anions, you've got to have some place where that uh, is resolved, and the magnesium cation is what does it. So whenever you've got a phosphate, you've nearly always got magnesium. You've, so again, here's, that, here's a metal that's so significant. And this can behave to give you uh, a pyrophosphatase that can actually effectively break up to give you... Uh, 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 shall we say, something like an acetal phosphate and a magnesium phosphate. 
and this so and, and that can be doing some work. Alternatively, you can actually make a pyrophosphate if you use that those protons which are outside the membrane. So uh, protons plus two ma magnesium phosphate plus uh, an ordinary phosphate will give you a magnesium diphosphate and of course water. And you've got to get rid of the water, but this is the kind of structure we would suggest was the very first kind of operating uh, molecule of life, energ energetic mo molecule. If we can do that, then we're using the proton motor force, that hydrogen or proton gradient, I should say, that can generate the pyrophosphate. The pyrophosphate can make longer amino acid chains. The amino acid chains makes the pyrophosphate behave better, so that can feed back to make better pyrophosphate and so on. So you've got something that can improve upon itself, and still we don't have coding. So, right, so we've used the proton motor force to make pyrophosphate, but can we use it for anything else? And we're not sure, and of course a lot of these ideas await experimentation. But for actually making a reduced carbon compound from carbon dioxide, we're suggesting that you can, we, we take what we know life can do, in this case something that's a fermenting system, uh, life can take uh, formic, formic acid and protons, that's uh, 2 plus H plus there and the HC double, uh, double O minus, and they can uh, get rid of protons, make hydrogen and make carbon dioxide. It's a fermentation. It needs nickel, iron, sulfides, and molybdenum. Always needs that. And we're suggesting that perhaps we could reverse this by pushing those protons on the outside from the carbonic ocean through the membrane, through nickel, iron, sulfides, and some molybdenum, which you've seen, uh, and generate formic acid from, and protons from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So this is, this is the, the first possible step, in our mind anyway, of how you would get to an organic molecule. So we've got, so just to go over it again, here's the hatchery, here's the pro natural proton motor force in uh, purple there, the, the, the protons are on the outside, they come through, they can make pyrophosphate, which can uh, make uh, polymer, polymerase organic molecules. Uh, this is what the actual structures look like that are inorganic. And eventually, of course, we need to have an organic take, a fully organic takeover. And I don't really have time to talk about that. Uh, and I haven't talked about the RNA world, but I just want to say one thing before I close on, the, on this on this idea of the react, this kind of reactor, and that is we've used a proton gradient. Uh, I've alluded to, but not talked about uh, a redox gradient. That is a gradient from reduced organic, uh, reduced molecules like hydrogen to oxidized molecules like carbon dioxide and nitric oxide. But there's also a temperature gradient. <coughs> And I think the temperature gradient is very significant early on as well. Many of you have heard of the polymerase chain reaction, and the polymerase chain reaction works by heating up uh, DNA, which becomes denatured it, it, uh, and comes apart, and then you can add, using mm -hmm. polymerase, you can add uh, other uh, nucleic acids to it, and it can uh, reproduce itself and keep on reproducing itself as you go through a temperature cycle between about 40 and 92 degrees centigrade. You just keep on doing this. And we would say this is a good place that you could actually have a natural polymerase, a convective polymerase reaction happening, even in these compartments. And somebody called uh, Eugene Kulin has taken this idea uh, and run with it and suggested that, yes, you can have a polymerase chain reaction, uh, but also if you can make long organic molecules, there's one more thing you can do without it, with it, and that is from a physicist's point of view, you can use the thermal gradient to drive uh, charged molecules to enrichment. So not only can you polymerize uh, and, and make more and more RNA, supposing you have RNA, but you can actually drive them into getting concentrated by a factor of 10 to the power of 6 or t even 10 to the power of 7. Extraordinary concentration mechanism. So the message really, I guess, everything has to be on a plate. We need all the energies in the one place and we mustn't deny the significance of thermal energy along with the uh, which is a thermal gradient, a temperature gradient, if you like, uh, a proton gradient, and also uh, an oxidation reduction gradient because of the distinction between hydrogen and carbon dioxide and nitric oxide. So, as astrobiologists, there's one more to think, one more aspect of the mindset, and that is often people, when 
they talk to me about the origin of life, they assume it's a kind of big bang. It, you know, just people who are not scientists, they say, oh, it's a kind of big bang. And of course, it's a, it is a kind of big bang. The emergence of life is a big bang. So here I've made an analogy between the pre-Big Bang universe and the Big Bang itself. And uh, a, a lovely book by Sean Carroll uh, on, on just this subject called From Eternity to Here, which I'm, it's, it's a great book. But what he points out, and many people would see this, is you have a Big Bang, and what do you have? You have incredibly high entropy. You've got huge energy, but you've got very low entropy. You've got, it's a pretty well-ordered system. And as we know, what happens with the universe, it just keeps on generating. Everything in the universe generates entropy. Or either it doesn't, it does nothing, or it tends to generate entropy. So, so this is a master generator of en entropy. They're all entropy generators. And what I would ask ourselves is, what is the Big Bang? What's the cause of the Big Bang and the emergence of life? So here's geochemistry, and here's biochemistry. Biochemistry isn't just better geochemistry. It's not. It, and you, you'd think about, you'd think that if you were to read the literature. Everybody's doing these experiments that are geochemical experiments and they're trying to show that they are also biochemical experiments. That, you know, they're going towards biochemistry. You've, th there is a real discontinuity. This is the start of the Big Bang. And we would say the significance here is the proton body force. That's what that extra force that helps uh, biochemistry to really take off. And when it has taken off, just like many far from equilibrium systems, it bifurcates. It bifurcates, uh, one, to make bacteria, we would say, well, we know that's true, and also to archaea, and we would say, why was that? Well, the they had two different jobs to do. One made the acetate that, that I concentrated on, and the other one figured out how to make methane better than the planet, and they become, became the methanogens, or the archaea. And that was the, true, that was the beginning of the, of, the, of the emergence of life, then we have this bifurcation between the bacteria and the archaea, and now the two main early domains of life, and you probably know the two then hybridize to make eukaryotes like trees, fungi, and us. Thank you. So I guess there are questions for Mike. If you order something happens. Who's having the first question or comment or it's, it's a lot of stuff that you presented, so I guess it's... Uh, but you can have the PowerPoint. No, yeah, no, if you want, can want to go back to the pictures. Sandra. You like your theory, you work on Mars. How do you see the possibility of life on Mars? I think that uh, we wrote a paper once which we were told by a philosopher we should never have written. And, that, and they, we said on that basically... Life was inevitable on Mars. There, there must have been, so we would say there must have been life on Mars. You don't have to go to Mars to know that we've been convected. You know, it's got to get rid of its thermal energy. And once it gets rid of its thermal energy, it puts chemical energy in the lurch. You know, these, hy these hydrothermal convection cells bring hydrogen to the surface. We know there's carbon dioxide on Mars, and there was plenty of it, of course, in times before. So there would have, how do you get rid of that energy? You have life. So the problem with all this, of course, is detection. You know, how do you detect it? And uh, so, and yeah, that's a major problem. But Venus is just to remind ourselves. Venus is similar. Uh, okay, it doesn't have any water anymore, but it does have what? Depending who you read, between 70 and 90 atmospheres of carbon dioxide. These all these rocky planets are carbon dioxide on the outside. And following up on that, uh, you could of course ask uh, if you. It subscribe to Menik Rosing's idea of producing, of the need of producing a granite, uh, and uh, of course uh, coming up with the energetic argument which, uh, which substantiates that. Uh, on Mars, we don't know of any granite. Would that uh, be a problem, or is that just because it uh, has not been efficient enough? I think, well, if, I, if I remember Menik. And he's one of my favorite geologists, I have to say. But if I remember Minnick's point, is that uh, you need the water to make the granite, but also doesn't life help all the system? You don't need granites, in Minnick's view, to make life. Uh, you need these ultramafic rocks. Yes. Uh, you, you immediately remind me of uh, Cyprus. You know, his, so here's Cyprus. It's a piece of ocean floor that's been brought up. It's called Cyprus because that's where the copper came from. Uh, Cupros. Uh, it's a... And, uh, People are puzzled. How did they mine all that copper? Uh, of course, they have copper sulfides and zinc sulfides and so forth. 
so they were blank smokers, basically. How did they mine all the copper? Well, they had to chop down the trees as pit props. How many times did they chop down the trees? Well, conservatively, they chopped down the trees eight times. So they completely denuded the island, and then it grew back. It grew back, you know. And that's, and that's why Venus Aphrodite comes from there. It's fertile, really a fertile island. Why is it fertile? Because it's got calcium, magnesium, silicates. Makes great soil. And the granite stone, I think. Mm-hmm. I have a question for you, uh, one of the last slides. Uh, as you know, I, I'm trying to write an article with Tony Bakshevsky, and he tells me, don't mention magnesium, because it's trivial. Everyone, every biochemist knows that you need magnesium too to make pyrophosphates or polyphosphates. So, but doesn't it indicate something? Yes, you've got to have, it, it's, it's trivial in amount. Yeah, but it's absolutely required. Let's, can I just, because that's, I mean, let's go back to his, I mean, we can't do without Balchevsky, and Margaret, that was, it was an incredible idea. Peptides are huge, pep, short peptides do an awful lot of work in life, and here's one of them. Uh, this is the one in peptidyl transferase in the ribosome. This is the one where uh, basically the peptides are, uh, can be generated by the ribosome, and this is where coding happens. But right there, to keep everything happy, is, and I don't have the whole thing here, but here's, here's the short peptide. And this peptide uh, s- actually sequesters six mag- magnesium ions to allow the, those phosphates in the RNAs to bond together. So again, it's, it's trivial, but you can't do without it. I mean, life cannot do without magnesium. Uh, I'd say. So I'm not sure why he says that. Well, because it would, would be too obvious, he, he thinks, <laughs> that, that you need magnesium, so you cannot write it in the title or... Oh, I see. Okay. Well, for a publication. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. To hear the RNA people talk, they don't need any metals at all. So they ought to know that they need metals. So tell them, in the title. Uh-huh. Even if it's only magnesium. I had a big argument with, with Lorraine Williams about this because he said, we don't want to talk to you guys in, in the enzyme business. Forget about it. You know, RNA is quite separate. And I said, you know, we've been doing this. We keep on splitting up. Let's try and find a join between uh, peptides and the origin of life with RNA. We've, I mean, we know we've got to get to RNA. And after all, you do need magnesium. Yeah. Well, Alexis. You mentioned that the emergence of life was a very rapid process. You said something like 10 to 20 nanoseconds. Yes. If you yeah. worked it out in the years, so go on. Go on. 3,000 years. 3,000, yeah, so, okay. Um, would that mean that you think that it's possible that life emerged several times? Uh, when you're as old as we are, then you know that the incumbents have got a huge amount of control. So, and it's true of life too. Once you've got life, then it's not going to deal, it's not going to allow any other life to get started. It'll eat it up. As soon as it's looking juicy, it'll eat it up. So there's only one origin of life. Well, there could have been two, okay? And that could have been the opposite chirality. So you could have those, and, and uh, we won the war, so to speak. But doesn't it take more than 3,000 years for life to spread globally? Oh, yes, probably. So, yes, okay, sorry. Uh, it's the survival of the most fitting life. Okay, so, of course, there could have been many things, but one of them won. And, we're, and, and the one that would won, we're all, did, everything is descended from. So there was only one origin of life, in a sense. But, of course, you're right. They could have, I mean, there were origin of life on Mars. You know, that's another, to my mind, that, you know, the, big, the big hope for me is that they would find life on Mars and it would have the opposite chirality. And that, that would... I don't know if Axel will allow that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved, of course, the opposite correlity making war with each other. But uh, regarding Alexis' point, I think uh, he, of course, has in mind uh, the importance of impacts. You might have impacts which might have produced temperatures well in excess of 400 centigrade. And uh, would life have... Uh, well, it's a cheap, it's, uh, I take a cheap shot of that, and that is that uh, the dinosaurs, as people like to say, and the, the dinosaurs survived the, uh, the 65 million year old KT boundary impact, in spite of all that sulfur uh-huh. dioxide. Uh-huh. You, it's, it's very hard, you know, if you're a gardener or farmer, how do you kill the weeds? 
That, and, and there's a better way of putting it, and that is that the thermal conductivity of wet rock is, uh, is extraordinarily low. So getting a thermal wave going through... So if we go right back to... I'm coming. So, how does it, so here's, here, here's our hatchery. You know, number one is the beginning of the iron sulfate compartments. Then you get proteinaceous cells, and then RNA, and then RNA and DNA, and then you get the split between the archaea and the uh, bacteria, and you start to make a deep biosphere, to my mind. And that anything that goes, and of course lots of bacteria and archaea are going to be blown out into this desert of the ocean, which is a kind of very rough place to be. So to my mind that that life then started to occupy the deep biosphere, where the chemistry is very similar, uh, very, the chemical interactions are very similar, the chemical uh, tensions are very similar. Uh, of course, um, the, the rates would have to be much lower, but, uh, but of course life speeds these up. So you get then in comes the impact, and if you've got this worldwide, I mean, I would, and if that would, sorry, that's a good point, you know, you'd, you know I'd have to, well, one, it would be, uh, what, what could I say, yeah, uh, 100 million years, probably, okay, to do the whole planet, maybe, something like that. But as soon as you get a big impact, and you're not going to kill off life down here, I don't think. I mean, unless it was absolutely extraordinary. And, but we know, it, in a way, it wouldn't matter, because it would just start again, just like the convection cell would start again. That's, I guess that's what you mean. Mm, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So this happens, could happen over and over. If you well, it could happen over and over, because we take life too seriously, uh, in a way, uh, you know, it's 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 a compa it's chemistry's answer to convection, really. It's mm -hmm. it's that ordinary. I mean, unless you really change the chemistry too much, and and you don't have the yes. relevant gradients. Uh, but it's hard to change the chemistry. Yes, right. It's so that's the, the other thing. The initial conditions are always going to be similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's only when oxygen comes in and kind of spoils things that it will be very hard. Uh, well, uh, in the same sense as uh, if, you were look, if, you, if you work on convection, you just have this minor perturbation and suddenly off it goes. Uh, as soon as the energy is there, and I guess that's 4.3, 4.35 billion years ago, my argument is, and the way, a good way to think about it, is how could you stop it? You know, it's not how you do it, but how could you stop it happening? I mean, we, we find it difficult to start it in the lab, of course that's true, but, but uh, it's a big laboratory out there. So we have lots of unknowns. Yeah, with with. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. In the uh, first pathway that you described in the beginning, uh, you, uh, where you have the uphill part of the reaction, you associated that also with uh, the with the need for life. But uh, but were these uh, were any of those steps actually requiring life, or was it just an analogy at that point? No. Uh, what I'm saying is that. Uh, you could do them slowly geochemically, yes. uh -huh. but, but because, to, to, because the universe likes to maximize entropy production, uh -huh. if you can, I don't know if you, how you feel about that, sure. but yes. if, it, if it does, yes. then of course life, um, it, it just can't help getting better and better and better. But, uh, but were it to be all downhill, you wouldn't need it, because we can see you wouldn't have to make acetate, because you can just uh -huh. turn the whole lot into methane, or keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't need life at all, anywhere. And, and those actually do exist in the present world and the present, uh, in, at present in also? What? The uh, the, any of these steps that you require for the uh, uphill reactions? Yes, and they're the ones that are challenging us all to um, on the origin of life. You know, how do we do this? Yes. And of course, the, I mean, the, the experiments are kind of obvious in our own minds, and that is you've got to be able to get a system where you put, make those protons go through a very thin inorganic membrane and see if you can make form it. So, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, you know, what, a, what would look like success for this kind of hypothesis would be making formate and formaldehyde in an iron sulfide chamber and making pyrophosphate using the same energy source. And then, I think, you know, I mean, you yeah, know, somebody do it. I mean, we're trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we're not going to be successful, so lots of people can, can follow. There's plenty of room in the origin of life. <laughs> no, people don't... People don't work on the original land. No, no, that's true. So, are you happy with that? 
That's an unusual assessment. You don't have to answer that. Yeah, one more. Okay. You already have Turkey on the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. That was at the last universal common ancestor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was as they, as you got away from the last. Well, of course, they were doing these different reactions yeah, yeah. because uh, it's it it uses the, they both use the same pathway. Uh, that's the coenzyme A synthase pathway. It's just that uh, I'll try and keep talking while I'm doing this. But the, uh, the so that's probably going on within the. Uh, within the same structure. So you're making methane in places where, where it's hotter and perhaps a lower pH and you're making acetate where it's, it's colder and higher pH. And then, and, and, then and they kind of... There, there, there it is. So, whoops. Oh dear, how do I get to the bed? Are you on a slide there? So, yes. Yeah, so, for example, I'm, I'm running at this now, but... So this is the. Uh, oh, I've got this in some kind of order. Right. So there's there's the reductive acid coenzyme synthase pathway to acetate. Notice you need molybdenum. Even to this day, you need molybdenum. Our view was to get to methane originally. You probably had to have molybdenum all the whole time, and that life kind of it found it hard to get molybdenum. Uh, so it, it 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 found some uh, organic uh, enzymes to do this acid coenzyme. Well, I'm sorry. What, uh, uh, what is it? Tetrahydromethanoltra? No, tetrahydrofolate. I mean, there it is. Uh, to do that, uh, but it still couldn't do those initial steps. It still had to have molybdenum for the very tough ones right at the beginning, and never has given up on it. And it, so that's molybdenum. You go to the methyl group. Here's the carbon monoxide. Put them together. Here's the acetal group, acetate group, uh, and then you can make cellular carbon. Uh, you can make uh, if you make a certain amount of energy this way, there's the acetate waste, the kind of waste product, the effluent, so to speak, and that feeds back a little bit of uh, ATP or pyrophosphate back to the system which you've got to have. Notice that you've got to have ATP for this system. Uh, and, but really, to keep that going, that's just, you're only getting one for one, and we know that that would be useful, uh, useless because then you were hoping for a perpetual motion machine, so then you've got to put the protons in here again from outside to keep on driving and making more ATP. So you do that, you make the, uh, that system, but then I think that what happens next is now we look at the methyl, methane pathway. This doesn't have to, but often uh, works best at high temperature. Uh, and that uses tungsten, because uh, tungsten is a better metal at higher temperature for redox. But, of course, tungsten and molybdenum are incredibly similar, I mean, in, in, and, uh, or fairly similar, anyway. And so we do the same thing. We make cellular carbon. That's okay. But that's no use unless you can make some energy. And here's the, the problem. Here's the energy cycle for this. I mean, I won't go into it. But, you know, to make energy is extreme, extremely complex. So we think that that's a little bit later, but it's still before the, the last universal common ancestor. It's still happening in there. And these two systems are so different that that's where the differentiation is drawn. And it's drawn for all kinds of reasons. The lipids are different. Many things are very different. It's just the, uh, the mechanism of the ribosome and so forth is similar. So we know it's the same... Oh, it's same source, but uh, the systems diverge. Did you imagine that in the beginning they were doing both things, but then some became uh, specialized? Well, and you could, I'm not sure whether you can differentiate that they're both doing this. Um, it's interesting, at least so far, you can, the methanogens don't generally make acetate. They can. But the bacteria, the, who, they're, they're the cleverest things on the planet. They can do it, I mean very broadly. I mean, clever is prokaryotes, let's say that. <laughs> I mean, they can do oxygenic, they do all kinds of photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis, you know, they made all the different, I mean, the two extraordinary things to happen with the origin of life and the origin of oxygenic photosynthesis, those were the two big things. Uh, so, so they, now, of course, I've forgotten what the question was. What? Uh, <laughs> so, it's something about, uh, yeah. So, 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 it's a common ancestor. Uh, they can't make methane. Isn't it incredible that the bacteria can do all these different things, but they can't make methane? It seems you need the archaea, the methanoarchaea, uh, to make methane. So there's a good reason for, I would say, a good reason for a bifurcation. 
Uh, and oftentimes, I think it's fair, I'm asking, appealing to Axel now, that oftentimes at the beginning of a far from equilibrium system, as it develops, then it'll often at least offer two pathways. Some, it might just one be taken, but generally you'll have a possibility of a bifurcation of spending energy uh, at the beginning of a system like this. Is that okay? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's stop it here then. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. As usual, if we want to continue discussions, there will be plenty of opportunity for that.